Well, good day, church. Let's pray together as we come to God's Word. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the great joy and privilege it is to gather this morning in this way across three campuses, um, to gather to have our hearts moved and changed and transformed by your Word and Spirit. And so, Lord, today we ask and we long and we desire that you would do a work in our hearts, a work of transformation that only you can do. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to our anniversary celebration for 2023. Uh, Anniversaries are often occasions to pause, reflect, and to give thanks, aren't they? Uh, Think of a wedding anniversary. Uh, My sister-in-law and her husband had a wedding anniversary dinner last night. You usually take um, your spouse out for dinner somewhere nice. Uh, You don't go to Macca's, or at least you don't usually go to Macca's. And then you, you gather, and then you talk about your marriage, you appreciate one another, and you celebrate, right? But when you think about it, anniversaries aren't just about looking back. Uh, Anniversaries are also about looking forward. You don't usually end your wedding anniversary dinner by saying, okay, honey, we've had a good run, I'll see you later. Uh, No, if you do, you probably won't have too many anniversary dinners left. Uh, But what you also usually do is you sit and you talk about how to keep growing in your marriage, right? Uh, You ask questions like, what have we done right that we can keep doing? What mistakes have we made that we need to improve on or maybe to even avoid? How can we keep loving and serving one another just as we committed when we said our vows? How can we keep committing our marriage to the Lord? That's the kind of conversations you ought to be having. Anniversaries are occasions to look back, but also to look forward. And I'd like us to do that today at our church anniversary service. Uh, You see, Grace Point Presbyterian Church was started in 1998 uh, when Pastor Dennis Law and a group of five elders gathered to plant a Presbyterian church that had an eye to the growing multi-ethnic community of Sydney. And I like to say, and just pause for a minute, and just appreciate how long ago 1998 was, okay? This makes Grace Point as a whole, now we were planted a year later, but Grace Point as a whole, that makes us 25 years old. Some of you weren't even born in 1998. That's kind of shocking, right? But we're going to do an activity. Are you ready? Who in this room was born 1998 and after? Raise your hands. 1998 and after, raise your hands. Now everyone look around and feel a deep sense of age welling inside of you, right? Now put your hands down. Mark, you're not lying to anyone. Don't worry. We... <laughs> now, right now, who in this room officially feels old? Raise up your hands. There we go. Now, let me tell you something, right? In 1998, our very own Pastor Eugene was 27 years old. Feels like a 21st speech, right? (laughs) He was young, vibrant looking, and passionate about the gospel. And so many of these things have faded. (laughs) But we thank God that his passion for the gospel hasn't. At least we have that, okay? Now, Grace Point uh, started um, a year later, 1999. Um, And as Pastor Eugene said, they started with about 25 members. Eugene was the minister. There were no elders. It was later on that um, men like Mark and Min became part of our elder board or our session. And as you look at Mark and Min, you'll know that they have well and truly lived up to the title of elder, right? Count their white hairs or their lack of hair, and you'll know exactly what I mean. Don't shake your head. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, jokes aside, I hope you can see that a lot of time has passed since 1998. Uh, We are no longer a core group of 25 members. We've grown to about 280, 300 adults with 50 to 60 children gathered across three campuses to worship our God and to grow in Christian maturity. We have a team of pastors and elders and pastors and elders in training, but more significantly, we have a huge team of lay leaders and volunteers and Christians like you who are gathered all across our city to evangelize, to to lead groups, to serve, to bear witness to the gospel, to live out a Christian life. You see, the real action doesn't happen from the pulpit. It happens from the pews, right? Um, You know, back then, Pastor Eugene and Uncle Roger 
used to lead music up front. Can you believe that? Thank God that their services are no longer needed, right? <laughs> I'm so glad you did not quit your day job, right? Lots have changed since 1998, but of course, we recognize that things have, haven't always been an uphill climb, right? We've had challenges and we've had heartbreaks. And those of you who have been along for a while, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The church is a gathering of imperfect people under a perfect God. And so we never want to pretend like we've gotten it all right and we've gotten it all together. We've made mistakes, and I pray that we've apologized well for them. And I also pray that we will be humble enough to make corrections as we go. But listen very closely. In the midst of all of this, I think one of the words that we could use to describe life at Grace Point since 1998 is that we've had a series of spiritual revivals. Now, what are revivals? Well, simply define revivals are fresh spiritual encounters when Christians grow deeper in the faith and the church grows wider in its reach. Fresh spiritual encounters where Christians grow deeper in their faith and where the church grows wider in its reach. And revival seems to be a really hot topic these days. If you're aware of the Christian scene and the Christian world, just this year, you know of Asbury University in the United States recently had an outbreak of what many call a revival. A story goes, right, there was a routine chapel service, which is common in Christian universities. It started on February 8th, and it kept going for 360 hours. It's like a very long service, right? It drew 70,000 people onto the campus for those 360 hours of worship and prayer. It, people call it a revival. And now, to be fair, some people have expressed skepticism and criticism about what's happened, but I found this entire series of events to be really interesting because it shows us something. It shows us that people are drawn to revivals. I mean, 70,000 people traveling all across the world literally to be a part of this. And what's more, um, churches and universities, they try to emulate, they try to mirror what was going on. There is a hunger, there is a longing. And I want to say that this desire for revival is a right desire. Uh, there can be many false expressions to be sure, but this longing, this impulse for it is correct. It is right, church, to crave a deeper experience of God and the gospel. And this is actually what Psalm 85 verse 6 says when the psalmist asks, will you not revive us again? There is a hunger, there's a longing, there's a desire for it. And I think this longing is especially vivid when we've had tastes of this here at Grace Point, right? Right? Spiritual revivals are being struck again by the gospel so that the messages of grace and mercy and hope taste like spring water on a scorching hot day, refreshing and renewing. We, we've seen this, haven't we, church? The fact that people have come to know Jesus here, the fact that people have matured in their faith, the fact that people are passionate in humble sacrifice unto Christ, the fact that people give generously, the fact that people are courageous in bearing witness to the gospel, and so church, my prayer during our anniversary service today is that we will look back and say, God, that was great. But also to look forward and to say in the words of the psalmist, God, revive us again. Because you see, revival is not just important for the church. It's also important for you and I. It is significant both corporately and personally. If you look at verse 6, do you notice what revival is tied to? Verse 6 says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? In other words, revival is tied to joy, happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment. Verse 7 shows us how this revival comes about. It says, show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Revival comes when God lavishes his love and salvation upon us through Jesus Christ. So as we work our way through Psalm 85, my hope and prayer is that we ought to, as a church, long for revivals because revivals give us the joy we desire. We ought to long for revivals because revivals give us the joy we desire. But you see, it's not that simple. There are obstacles. There are barriers to this, right? Come to point one with me because as we see, uh, Psalm 85 portrays three enemies of revivals. Three enemies. Read verses 1 to 3 with me. 
You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Let's pause there. One of the interesting things I hope you notice is the relationship between favor, fortune, and forgiveness. You see it? Favor, fortune, and forgiveness. Now remember, the context of this entire psalm is verse 6 to 7, revival. And so in verses 1 to 3, the psalmist is looking back at when this has taken place in the life of God's people. It's like an anniversary of Psalm 85, right? The psalmist is looking back at when this sort of revival has been tangible and experienced in the life of Israel. He's remembering when God showed his favor and fortune. And all this came about when the Lord forgave them for their sins and set his anger and wrath aside. Now, church, this here gives us profound insight into how sin, and in particular, complacency with sin, how complacency with sin is one of the enemies of revival. Because what we see in our passage is that God's forgiveness is the path to revival, but then forgiveness always comes after confession. It always comes after repentance. There can be no forgiveness without confession and repentance. But you see, complacency with sin says this. It says, you know what? This sin isn't that bad. In fact, I think this sin is actually okay. I know what God says about my sin, but the truth is, if you really know me, it's actually not that destructive. It's kind of okay. And so rather than confessing and repenting, complacency settles and lives with that sin and allows that sin to take root in our lives. And I just want us to realize that at best, complacency is connected to spiritual idleness and apathy. At best, it's all about spiritual idleness and apathy. And so we need an awakening, a revival. But you see, at worst, complacency is connected to an unregenerate heart. It could indicate that you and I may not actually be saved. And it's, so, it's no surprise that there are times when revivals are impossible because you cannot revive spiritual vitality when spiritual life is not even present. But church, you see, our hearts often grow complacent with sin, not always because we hate what God says. I want you to listen to that once more. We grow complacent with sin, not always because we hate what God's Word says. We become complacent with sin, not just because we lack energy or motivation or discipline to put that particular sin to death. It's not always that way. More often than not, we grow complacent because in our heart of hearts, we actually believe that that particular sin is what gives us joy. It's interesting, isn't it? As you observe the history of Israel, what you'll find is that generation after generation falls into sin, not always because of conscious intention of rebelling against God, Rather, they fall into sin and remain in sin because they believe that these sins would give them their heart's desires, joy. Whether it's Adam and Eve in the garden who ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Cain killing Abel out of jealousy, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah indulging in sexual immorality, the Israelites worshiping the golden calves, David committing adultery with Bathsheba, the Israelites engaging with idolatry, injustice, and oppression. As we examine Scripture... Rarely do we find them committing these things chiefly because they hate God, though we know theologically that is the reason. But as we read of their explanations and their motivations, many of them do this because they believe that these sins are greater than God's promises. They believe that these would give them the joy that their hearts long for. Complacency with sin, but that's not the only enemy, is it? As we work our way through verses 4 to 5, I want you to notice how frequently the plural is used. You see it? Restore us. Put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? These requests here show that sin is not just an individual affair. It is incredibly corporate and communal. Now, theologically, we recognize that all of us have sinned under Adam. And so it's no surprise that we speak of the corporate and the shared nature of sin. But I want you to notice, it's not just an abstract idea. 
Listen closely. I'm sure we all know that sin is amplified in the presence of people. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever noticed that every workplace has a culture? That every family has its own rituals and habits? That every friendship group has its own idiosyncrasies? Have you noticed that every church has its own idols? And then have you ever noticed that you as an individual is often impacted and influenced by all of these cultures, rituals, idiosyncrasies, and idols? Verses 4 to 5 shows us there is a danger in having our convictions shaped by consensus. There is a danger in having our convictions shaped by consensus. That's why the plural is so prominent. It recognizes that the masses, consensus, has profound influence on how we live. And so the psalmist calls for forgiveness, not just for himself, but also for his people and for subsequent generations in church. This is a cautionary tale for us. Because I hope we see that we are more impacted by our context and our circumstances than we realize, perhaps more than we dare to admit. Our surroundings actually shape our sins. Now you see, this does not absolve us of individual responsibility, but it does show us that flowing with the current or riding popular consensus inevitably leads us to a place of divergence from God's will. But when you think about it, right, consensus makes sense. Consensus is easier. We often believe that there is a greater chance that we'll be right if we go with the consensus. We live in a democratic society, right? I hope you guys voted yesterday, right? And so if the majority is true, and if they're right, then I'm probably right as well. But you see, if the majority is wrong, then at least we are all wrong, right? There's a little bit less shame about that. But don't you see that conviction by consensus is just another way of pursuing joy by chasing after inclusion, approval, and safety in numbers? It's another way of pursuing joy apart from God rather than in God. And these sorts of joy feel like true joy, but they are fleeting. They never last. Conviction by consensus actually makes it easier to be complacent with sin because everyone's doing it. The last enemy is comfort in autonomy. Read what verse 8 says. I will listen to what the Lord says. This is the psalmist speaking about receiving revival from God. An instrumental to this is to listen to what God says, God's promise. And, and of course, the sinful heart wants none of that. Sinners like you and I far prefer the comfort of listening to ourselves rather than God. And listen closely, church. One of the greatest lies of our time is that joy and happiness comes from listening to yourself or listening to your heart. Grace Point was planted in 1998, 10 years before that, 1988, Roxette released the song, Listen to Your Heart, and it has gripped multiple generations. Some of you younger ones, you know it, not because of Roxette, but because the TV show Glee redid a version of that song. And some of you, you're probably ashamed of this, you know this song because you know the EDM or the heart style version to it, okay? And of course, this is a love song, but it continues to resound uh, in our heads. And, and some of you are probably singing that song right now, yeah, right now that I've mentioned it. But, but it grips us because the core of that song is a call to listen to nothing and no one else but what your heart wants. It's so modern but it's as old as time. It's the serpent's lie that you can be like God, determining good and evil. The word autonomy literally means to live under no law. No law except for whatever law we come up for ourselves. I do what I want, when I want, however I want, with whoever I want. There is this instinctive, primal desire for joy, but you see... What each of these enemies of revival have in common is that they promise joy, but offer none of it at all. We have an entire listen-to-your-heart generation, and we have an entire lost, confused, and depressed generation. 
The world offers so much but delivers none of it at all. And in fact, they are the very enemies of the very thing that offers joy. True joy, as we say again and again, is found in the gospel through redemption in Christ. But church, let's not pretend that we have not fallen prey to complacency with sin. That we have not fallen prey to conviction by consensus or comfort in autonomy. You see, the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to pretend. We can actually freely admit that as we read these things, we can identify ourselves in this very psalm. So if all of these reflect our common desire for joy, and they are the antithesis of joy, then the question that you and I ought to be asking is, what do we need? What are the elements necessary for revival, for joy? The problems are identified, and actually in our psalm, if you come to point two, there's actually uh, corresponding solutions. Because if an enemy of joy is complacency with sin, then part of that solution has to be that you and I ought to be heartbroken over sin. Heartbroken. We need to arrive at a point when we realize that the sin that promised joy in life has only led us to the grave. For without heartbrokenness, or another theological word for this is contrition. Without contrition, remorse, sorrow, or repentance, listen, there can be no revival. Unless we come face to face with the reality that our sin is the very stumbling block to our joy, we will never experience all that God has to offer to us in Christ. And you see, church, we will only be heartbroken over sin when we see our sin through the holiness of God. It is when we see God to be so otherworldly, so pure, so supreme, so holy, are we prepared to admit that we are the exact opposite? We will never be heartbroken over sin if we compare ourselves to the people around us. Because there will always be someone who we think is less than us. We will always think that we are better than someone else. That is not a place of heartbrokenness. That is a place of Phariseeism. But to see ourselves before God, that is a whole new experience. The German reformer Martin Luther knew this, and he once wrote this on a piece of paper. He says, we are all mere beggars showing beggars where to find bread. I love that. We are mere beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. By that, he meant that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Isn't that the whole theme of Psalm 85? Read it with me. That God would forgive our iniquity, cover our sin, set aside His wrath, turn from His anger, restore us, show us His unfailing love, grant His salvation, promise His peace. Look at this. These are all salvific and redemptive categories. In other words, we don't become heartbroken over sin so that we may despair. We become heartbroken over sin so that we may be repaired. Not to despair, but to be repaired so that God would renew us and make us whole again. But I want you to notice something, right? This here is not just a generic restoration. Read verse 10 to 11 with me. It says, Let uh, love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Church, if you blink, you'll miss this, okay? But upon showing us the enemies of sin, the psalmist now shows us what we need. It is when, notice the imagery, when love and the faithfulness of God comes together, when the righteousness and the peace of God comes together. The language of kiss here is to indicate that these virtues are so intimate that they come together, you can't separate them. And church, let me ask you a question. Redeeming love, faithfulness, righteousness, peace, coming together, what are you thinking of? All of this here is actually a perfect promise of the incarnation, Christ. Because it is in Jesus, the Son of God, who is the perfect embodiment of both God's love and both God's faithfulness to save His people. He is the perfect embodiment of God's righteousness. Jesus satisfied the righteous requirements of the law on behalf of sinners so that those who trust in Him can have their sins paid for so that those who trust in Him have Christ's righteousness imputed, placed upon them. He is the perfect embodiment of true and lasting peace for all who humbly receive it. Don't you see? 
This is a faithfulness that can be tangibly experienced here on earth. That's what the psalmist says. But the source actually comes from heaven. Church, I want you to see that God is not withholding His grace from us. He lavishes it freely on all who lean and trust in Him for forgiveness and life. And so, brothers and sisters, we become heartbroken over sin, not to heap more guilt on ourselves, but to receive more grace from God. As we confess to Him, recognizing that He knows better than we do, as we show our desperate need for Christ our Savior, that His path is actually the path to life. The promise of salvation in Christ is actually what makes repentance possible. It's an essential element. Church, let me offer you a point to ponder. What sins have you grown too comfortable with? What sins have you grown too comfortable with? I'm so conscious that all of us wrestle with common sins, but also unique sins. There are some sins that we know break God's heart and break God's law, and we labor by God's Spirit to put them to death. There are some like that. But there are also some sins that grip our hearts that we just don't want to let go. And my dear brother and sister, do you see that this is actually hindering God's work of revival in your heart? The work of restoring deep and explosive joy in your life. You see, letting go of sin can be hard, of course. Because you see, the reason they've gripped our hearts is because there is an appeal to them, right? We are drawn to them because there is an appeal. But you see, the gospel, listen very closely, doesn't just call us to let go and that's it. It doesn't just say, let go and be empty. Rather, the gospel calls us to let go in order that we may lean on God. Let go in order that we may be filled. It's a let go of that empty ice cream cone in order that we may be filled with something infinitely even greater. It's not so that we may receive more guilt, but more grace as we experience that afresh once more. Another essential element of revival then is for humble prayer and confession. Humble prayer and confession. Do you see that this entire psalm is actually written in a form of a prayer and confession? It's not like Paul's letters. It's not like the gospel writings. It's a reflective prayer and confession of one who longs for. I want you to read the tone. He longs for revival from God. And church, it's no surprise that in the history of the Christian church, in the history of Christian revivals, one of the major characteristics of all of these events is desperate and humble prayer and confession. Desperate and humble prayer and confession. It's very interesting, right? Uh, one of the names we often hear Pastor Eugene quote from the pulpit is a pastor by the name of Jonathan Edwards. It's either Edwards or it is C.S. Lewis, right? And for good reason. Because Jonathan Edwards was extremely well known for his involvement in the extraordinary revivals of the 1730s and 1740s. Now, a lot can be said about the relationship between Edwards and revivals, but I want you to notice, and it shocked me, that more often than not, when we think of Edwards and revivals, we think about his preaching, which sparked revivals, and that's certainly true. But underlying all of that is actually Edwards' belief that God uses prayer as an instrument for revival. He recognized that revival is all God's work, right? We do none of it. But God delights in using the gift of prayer to pour out His Spirit and His gospel in a fresh and unique way. You see, God often uses seemingly blunt instruments in order to display His glory. Has it ever occurred to you that God chooses very ordinary and sometimes counterintuitive means to accomplish His purpose? Have you, have you realized that? Uh, we hear a lot of kids in the background right now, and that's it for a wonderful reason. We've got lots of kids in life, our church, and one of the things I love about kids is reading kids' Bibles, right? Sometimes they're clearer than my sermons, right? Um, so I was um, reading um, the story of the walls of Jericho to Anastasia the other night. And you know the story, right? It's from um, the book of Joshua. God tells the Israelites to conquer the land, and they are to do this by destroying the walls of Jericho. But do you remember the story? How does God tell them to do this? Not to barge in, 
um, you know, when I think when I read this, the walls of Jericho, I kind of remember uh, the second book of the Lord of the Rings, right? Battle of Helm's Deep, right? If you know the story, if you've seen the movie, right? How, how do you defeat Helm's Deep? Well, Grimmer Wormtongue says, Helm's Deep has but one weakness. It's outer wall. There's a little drain there. That If you just break through that, you're on your way in. And as you watch the movie, you know that's exactly what they do, right? This orc-like figure carries an explosive, charges through, blows up that drain, and the walls crumble, and the battle is almost won at that point. It, it makes sense. You're meant to attack your opponent at their point of weakness, but that's not how God told the Israelites to take down the walls of Jericho. Instead, God tells them to march around the city walls once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, and then blow their trumpets and the walls will fall. Now, was their ban that bad that the walls fell? No, I don't think that's the point, right? And so you see, I'm, I'm reading this story to Anastasia, and I ask her, now, dear, how is this possible? How is it possible that the Israelites defeat Jericho with just music? And then I panicked when I asked that question because I thought to myself, oh, true. How is it possible? And now Anastasia is staring at me, waiting for me to answer my rhetorical question. I'm kind of stuck, right? How is it possible? And that's when I realized that's the point. It's not. It's not possible. There is absolutely no reason for why it should have worked apart from God. All of this happened so that the Israelites would know that it was the Lord their God who delivered them into victory. They did not even lift a sword. That they would know that it was God's power and not theirs that brought them into the land. So that there is no illusion. It was not their military might, but God's power. But I want you to notice, right, that's in the Old Testament, but the pattern continues. Uh, you see, today, so many people say that preaching is one of the most ineffective ways to communicate the gospel. All across the world, people are saying, no one remembers what the preacher says. It's such a terrible way to teach. It has no power to change. If you want something that works, have a dialogue, watch a movie, play a skit, add some music, then maybe we're on to something. But is it interesting that the Bible insists that it's through the preaching of the Word and the Gospel that hearts are changed? Is it intriguing that Paul's final words to Timothy is to preach the word in season and out of season? Is it intriguing that God gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us as we expound the Holy Scriptures? Church, listen very closely. Perhaps the weakness of preaching is a feature and not a bug. Perhaps all of this is so that any sort of spiritual transformation can be attributed not to the preacher, but to the one he is preaching about. Perhaps it is God's purpose to use the very ordinary means of exposition to bring about the explosive power of the gospel. So that like the walls of Jericho standing and crumbling, those who witness the preaching of the word, changing lives, will say, you know what? Only God could have done that. There is no way the preacher is that good. God uses seemingly blunt instruments to display His glory, and He uses prayer for Revival. And we think of revival and prayer, we realize that there are at least two kinds of prayer, right? There is prayer for revival, and then there is prayer that facilitates revival. I'll say that again. There is prayer for revival, and there is prayer that facilitates revival. Prayer for revival, as we think of Edwards, we, we think of him as preaching for revival. But what people don't realize is that years and maybe even decades before all this took place, he gathered a group of pastors and lay leaders to pray that the Spirit of God through the work of God was spread across the land, spread across the colonies, that they spent time on their knees before they ascended into the pulpit to preach. Church, don't you realize that prayer is so integral? He led others in humble prayer, asking the Lord to do this. Please, Lord, and we're asking the same, that you would do a work in our generation. But you see, this prayer didn't just spark revivals. It, as, as, as revivals spread, people continue to pray. But this prayer is the humble confession of sin. This is the prayer that facilitates revival. It's when people admit they're rebelling against God and their need for Christ. You see, something powerful takes place in confession. 
it, it's sometimes hard to believe that. It's sometimes hard to feel that. Because more often than not, we are so surrounded by noise and distractions, we are barely comfortable, 30 seconds all alone, no voice, no sound. Whenever there's even just a slightest moment of silence, we pull out our phones, we scroll something, we listen to something, we watch something. It completely blocks God out, and it completely blocks out any opportunity to do business with God. But confession is powerful. Because as we lay our sins and vulnerabilities and rebellions against God, grace becomes more real. Mercy becomes more tangible. The gospel is shown to be sweeter than ever before. There's a quote in your outlines by Diedrich Bonhoeffer about confession. Let me read it for us. It says, in confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. We know this, don't we, as a church? The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. That's why our confession is always corporate, yeah? In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. Since the confession of sin is made in the presence of Christian brother or sister, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. Oh, there is so much to unpack here, right? But don't you see that chiefly, sin is the barrier to joy, and prayerful confession is what leads to joy and revival. Revival swept Edwards' generation as people came under no illusions about the state of their own hearts. It caused them to cling closer to the cross and the gospel. It caused them to be zealous for the gospel. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I would not hasten to say that I think many Christians today are functional atheists when it comes to prayer. Many Christians today are functional atheists when it comes to prayer, including myself. We believe it is a good thing because the Bible says so. But if we look at our practice of prayer, then chances are we will show ourselves to be people who don't really believe in prayer. And there's a sense in which I don't blame you, right? Because it seems powerless. It seems so passive. Wouldn't we rather do something than just pray? It seems so weak. But perhaps, church, this is a feature and not a bug. Perhaps like marching around the walls of uh, Jericho or preaching the word, the weakness of prayer is intentionally designed to demonstrate the power of God. So that when revival does come, we have no other explanation for the fact that only God could have done that. Friends, don't you see, revival gives us the joy that we desire. We get to watch God work and prayer is integral to that. Here's another point to ponder then. Will you join us in humble prayer for revival in your own hearts and for our church? Will you join us in humble prayer for revival in your own hearts, but also for our church? I hope that our prayers, our collective prayers of revival would stir within us a greater hunger for it. And equally as significantly, our prayers of confession will purify our hearts and prepare ourselves for the work that God is going to do to us. Revival and renewal begins with repentance. Third essential element, I'll be brief on this because I know this is something we continue to emphasize in the life of Grace Point, right? There needs to be hunger for God's word. Verse 8 says this, I will listen to what the Lord says. Commenting on this verse, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon says, when we believe that God hears us, it is natural we should be eager to hear Him. When we believe that God hears us, it is only natural that we are eager to hear Him. So good, isn't it? Part of revival is wanting to hear God's word and God's voice above all else. It is God's word that brings light into darkness, that gives us life in the face of death, that gives us transformation and renewal by the work of the Spirit. Every revival in the history of the church has always been accompanied by a Bible revolution. And may that be so of us, that we would never grow beyond the words of Scripture, that we would seek and savor and search with all of our hearts that we may know the will and the ways of God.
So then there are some expressions for revival, my third and final point. The first expression connected to what I said before is an unexplainable work of the Spirit, an unexplainable work of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice then how frequently the word you, Y-O-U, is used all throughout the psalm. That you refers to God. But not just God in general, it is God the Spirit. It is the Spirit who moves and shows us our sin, the Spirit who draws us to God, the Spirit who transforms our hearts. And so one of the ways that we know revival is taking place is when we sit back, we observe everything that is going on, and then we throw our hands up and we say, you know what, there is no natural explanation for what we're seeing. Only God could have done that. And church, I feel like this is the history of our church. Let me be honest with you, right? We have a great leadership team. I mean, Pastor Eugene leads it, right? But you know what? He's not that good. I work with him. I know, right? No disrespect, right? But in all seriousness, do any of our pastors and elders and leaders have any power to change hearts and lives? Let me ask you a question. You, dear disciple maker and Christian, whether in CGs or one-on-one or whatever settings, do you have the power to transform people from darkness into light? Do any of us have the ability to give that long and deep satisfaction that our hearts long for? You've got to be kidding. Church, only God by His Spirit could have done what we see in the life of our church. And that's what we got to keep longing for. That's what we keep praying for, that God will work in us and, if necessary, in spite of us, to display His glory. The unexplainable work of God by His Spirit is a really clear expression, church, and I feel like God is doing something in the life of our church right now. Another tangible expression of revival then, as we see in Psalm 85, is deeper joy in the Lord, right? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? This comes when people inside the church arrive at a new level of experience and understanding of the gospel. It's when the gospel strikes them afresh. It's when nominal Christians awake from their spiritual slumber and realize what's at stake. And there are so many manifestations of this joy. I've mentioned before, a hunger for God's word. Prayer is one of them. But I also want us to notice that in verse 13, it also includes a commitment to Christian holiness. Pay close attention with me. Different English translations render this verse a little differently. But at the heart of verse 13 is two things. You ready? Number one, verse 13 says, God reestablishes righteousness through His work of redemption. That's number one. Number two, God's redeemed people are therefore to walk in the path of righteousness. That's what verse 13 is actually trying to say. In other words, those who are heartbroken over sin and turn to Christ then walk in the path of righteousness and holiness. And this is why some people always have skepticisms about different revivals because they always say time will tell. Because one of the clear manifestations of revivals is when people hunger and long for holiness and godliness. After all, sanctification is God's will for us. That's where joy is found. One more point to ponder then. Would people around you characterize your life as one marked by a commitment to Christian holiness? Will people around you characterize your life as one marked by by a commitment to Christian holiness? That's such a good question to wrestle with, right? Because sometimes we can have an overinflated sense of ourselves, like I think I'm really holy, but if we were to take a step aside and imagine ourselves in someone else's shoes, that might illuminate our reflections a little bit more. Don't you see, church, your hunger for joy is right here. All that sin promises Intimacy, love, satisfaction, fulfillment, and hope is actually found in being reconciled to God, being redeemed by God, and found in running with God. Tangible expression is when people around can say, wow, you look like a Christian. It may seem like such a small and low bar, but that's the reality. Another expression of revival then as a consequence of the church growing in deeper in joy, lastly, is that the gospel begins to have a wider reach in our city. That 
is really important. Because there's a sense in which that's only natural, right? Because Christians who truly grasp the depths of grace have an infectious faith. And this faith begins to be seen not just in what they love and what they know, but in how they live. They begin to show the truth, beauty, and goodness of the gospel. There begins to be a desire to bring others along to experience the new life that is found in Christ. And so this genuine practice of faith and this generous offer of grace often produces a spiritual revival where conscious non-Christians, like those who reject God, those whose hearts are hardened against God, even they are drawn into the life of the church. They are converted and they are moved. Church, that's when the church begins to grow. And I want to say, right, Christians moving from one church to another is not growth. That's an illusion of growth. We need to be careful. Genuine biblical growth is when people turn from darkness into light, from sin and death into life and light in Christ. Psalm 85 verse 9 says, salvation is near those who fear him. There is no discrimination to whom this is offered to. It's for those who love the Lord, who worship God as holy. Regardless of your age, background, or history, it's for anyone else in this world. Church, as I conclude, I pray that you are gripped and compelled by this vision that we see in Psalm 85, where fortune, favor, and forgiveness of God reigns over God's people, where we are rejoiced, renewed, and restored. It's what our hearts long for. It's what we need. Revival is totally God's work, but I hope and pray you see that God uses means, the means of confession, the means of prayer, the means of holiness. You see, in the last 25 years, we've seen our church grow from 25 people to about 280 to 300 people, depending on who's there on those Sundays, right? That is roughly a 1,000% growth in 25 years. Not 100, right? I was like, oh, 24. Is that 100%? No, it's not. It's 1,000% growth. Now, to be fair, not all of that is evangelistic, yeah? Some of you have come from other churches, so let's just halve that to be generous. That is still incredible. This reminds me of the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, right? Good soil bearing fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. But that's all God, isn't it? Church, what would it look like for our church to experience a revival again where we see another 1,000% increase in the next 25 years? Now, don't tell me it's not possible. God's done it. What would that look like for us as we as a church spend time on our knees in desperate, humble prayer, asking the Lord to revive us as we confess, as we lean, as we trust? Those of you who can do quick maths knows that that puts us into the range of about 3,000. But you see, it's very easy to become obsessed with numbers in the sense in which if there's any sign to do it, it's today because we have ACM, so numbers are important, right? But I hope and pray you see that behind each number is a person. And behind each person is a soul searching for joy and meaning. Behind each number is a sinner needing salvation by grace through faith. Now, church, God can do it. That's why the expression of Psalm 85 verse 4, restore us again. Verse 6, will you not revive us again? May that be our prayer, church, that the Lord would do this in our hearts and our church. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word to us in Psalm 85 today. We ask, dear Lord, that your word would take root and stir within us a deeper longing for revival and for joy, for the glory of your name and for the good of your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.